Hi, Jerry Pal listeners. Just want to do a special shout out in the beginning to all of the recent donors to the Jerry Pal podcast. If you're interested in donating, go to the Jerry Pal website and just click that big blue button. Special thank you to Margaret Leung, Huey Lin, Ken Langa, Susan McFadden, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa Galicia Castillo, Cara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordofsky, and Meg Walhagen. Thank you very much. And on with the show. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we are delighted to welcome Susan DeMorris, who is director of the California Department of Aging. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Susan. Happy to be here. And from Thank the other you. side of the country, we're delighted to welcome Greg Olson, who is director of the New York State Office for the Aging. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Greg. Thanks a lot. I'm really excited for the conversation today. And we're delighted to welcome Lindsay Yorman, from, who is now as a new role. She's a geriatrician. She's a longtime friend and mentee and now a peer and is a key component of the ePrognosis Working Group and helped like originate the ideas that uh, led to e-prognosis. And she's now San Diego County's chief geriatrics officer. Welcome to Jerry Powell, Lindsay. Thank Welcome, you Lindsay. so much. You're very kind, Alex. Well, we got a, a lot to talk about what states are doing and cities are doing to support older adults in the community. And including Lindsay, at some point, I want to hear what the heck a chief geriatric officer does for... Um, a county. Um, but before we go into that, somebody here has a song request for Alex. That's me. Uh, I I asked Alex to play U2's A Beautiful Day. And why, Susan? It is my anthem. Um, you know, when you live in California, it's usually a beautiful day. But also I thought, you know, for a while there with older adults, it was described as the silver tsunami. And if I leave this audience with one thing, never, ever say that. Please don't compare the aging of older adults in our nation to a disaster. And so I think it's a beautiful day that we're putting a spotlight today on older adults. And in our state, one in four people will soon be 60 or older. So it's a real asset to our state and nation. So that's why I picked a beautiful day. Wonderful, Susan. That is terrific framing and also hopefully makes up for that phrase making it into one, to one, into one of our podcasts that uh, recently. Oops. Thank you so much for brazing that terrific point. Um, here's a little bit of the song. The heart is a bloom shoots up from the stony ground but there's no room no space to rent in this town you're out of luck and the reason that you had to care the traffic is stuck you're not moving anywhere it's a beautiful day Falls, you feel like a beautiful day. Don't let it get away. Great song suggestion, Susan. Yeah. Nice. Well done. I'd like to start right. off with both asking Susan and Greg the, the same question. You are both running state departments on aging. Is that right? Are, are both, I guess, different names? Are, is that fair to say state departments on aging, like in general? Right. Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. Greg, yep. how did you get interested in this and in particular this, this role as the director? Yeah, uh, great question. So we're actually designated state units on aging um, that are designated by our governors. Um, I got into this 31 years ago. I'm a geriatrically trained social worker, and it was my grandmother. Um, I was working with abused children at the time, and um, I watched my grandmother really devolve um, at the end of her life, didn't have the support she needed to um, stay in her home and community, had to spend down and impoverish herself uh, into Medicaid, 
And I thought that there had to be a better way. I've also been very connected with older people, meaning that what I've been culturally taught to believe through cartoons, movies, media, television, et cetera, didn't match my own reality in terms of the value of older people. So started as a direct uh, case manager, um, worked in a variety of different places, including the state legislature. And I've been with the state office now since uh, 2006. Hmm. And Susan? So I got my start working for a member of Congress doing constituent casework. And uh, a lot of the casework was supporting older adults with VA, Social Security, Medicare, immigration casework. Um, And from there, I went to work on a statewide ballot initiative. So, you know, talking about palliative care here on this podcast um, in our state, gosh, this was in the early 90s, physician assisted death. Um, was on the ballot. And at that time, I was working um, on the opposition because my view was it was a false choice for people until they had a full array of services, including palliative care that was really not uh, hospice and palliative care weren't very yeah. well known or available in the early yeah. 90s. And so a lot of care was just a tiny, tiny baby by that back then. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the word even surfaced. So I've been on a quest to build those um, services and support so that people um, can make true informed decisions for themselves and their families. Great. Thank you both. I wonder if you can give our audience a sense. Like I, I did a geriatrics fellowship, a wonderful geriatrics fellowship residency. I had some idea. I've heard of areas of aging before. Not 100% sure about state uh, what which state units on aging. Is that the correct term, Greg? State that's, unit? The, that's a statutory term. And then we all call ourselves something different. Something different. And you're in that's New York, right, Eric? You, I, I did residency in New York. So yeah. I, have, I have both. Uh, I've been in both of your territories. And then I know about like things that I think Areas on aging do, area agencies aging do, like Meals on Wheels and things like that. But can you maybe give us like, either of you know a little history lesson for us? Like, how did this all develop? And does every state have these units? Susan, you or me? Go for it, Greg. So I think it's a little known fact that uh, the Older Americans Act, which is kind of our mothership, was passed at the same time as Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. And it was designed to to really balance um, what, you know, Medicaid at the time was to provide nursing homes and Medicare is obviously health insurance. Um, But what you need is a community based game there. You know, acute care is called acute care for a reason. It's short, it's episodic. And then where do you go? You go back home. So the idea was to create a robust community based infrastructure that could help uh, older adults uh, succeed in their homes and communities, whether they were healthy how to keep them healthy, or they were at imminent risk of, um, you know, emergency room uh, visits, hospitalizations, or nursing home placements. Uh, Equally as important is if you wind up in in an ED or being hospitalized or wind up in rehab, um, eventually you're going to be discharged back home. Um, And so we are really the ones that are doing the heavy lift. The long-term care is being actually provided in the community at a much higher rate than what the formal system provides. I think the problem is, and this is something Susan and I deal with every day, we're on the discretional side of the ledger, which means we have a fixed amount of money that we receive from the Older Americans Act, and we have to budget for that for the entire year, whereas things like Medicaid um, and Medicare, once you're eligible, you can receive that service, you know, generally speaking. And yeah. so our goal is really to um, to resource the things that we do so you can prevent higher levels of care and Medicaid spend down. And we've been proven to do that for over 50 years. And does every state have a State Department of Aging? Is that a requirement? Yes. And, yep. and how does area, wait, area agencies on aging, how does that fit into all of this, Susan? So state units on aging oversee a network of AAAs, they're called. In California, we have a network of 33. They cover 58 counties. So, you know, if you go state to state, they're all organized differently. They might be called something else, but the the framework is the same in every state. Ours are a combination in our state of county run, like uh, Dr. Yerman's um, is a great example in San Diego, 
We also have joint powers agreements where there might be a collection of counties that band together. And then we have nonprofits that are community-based organizations. And all of them offer the same array of services, uh, really emphasizing social determinants of health and preventive services like falls prevention, chronic disease self-management, caregiver training. And then, as you mentioned, uh, senior nutrition is a big part of it where um, providers like Meals on Wheels may be a contractor, but also many of our AAAs run their own nutrition services in-house. So you get a combination of in-house and contracted services. So let me get this straight. Things like Meals on Wheels, that's through the, the AAAs, Areas in Aging, and Areas in Aging are through these state units on aging. This is a, and you wouldn't know this, so this is not a knock on you. Um, I, I let me clear. Well, I do yeah. not know this, I which don't is either. which yeah. is what's part the, of the problem, right? There is this like <laughs> opaqueness <laughs> that even a geriat- I, geriatrician who's been practiced for nearly twenty years is still confused. So uh, the language Susan uses is really important. Uh, it's the nutrition program. So we operate the largest nutrition program in the country. Meals on Wheels is a brand like Dunkin' Donuts is to coffee. Ah, uh, oh. We're organized the same way. So in New York, uh, we have very few Meals on Wheels programs. They are a combination of either direct provided by our 59 area agencies or they're done by contract. Um, so it's really the nutrition program, which is inclusive of congregate meals. Those are, you know, in, it could be in housing, it could be a standalone senior center, home delivered meals, nutrition counseling, and nutrition education done by registered dietitians. And then let me ask another question is, so the state units, what the states are doing in aging, in addition to the AAAs, what else? does the state department do or state unit do? You know, in our state, it's about 50-50 state funded and and federal Older Americans Act funded. So we've really grown this space in California. And one of our signature um, activities is um, the master plan for aging. So our governor, Gavin Newsom, embarked on this in when he took office four years ago, an executive order to develop a master plan for aging that is across all departments and agencies. So this includes transportation, driver's license, parks, um, volunteerism, um, housing, and of course, health and human services. So that that would be an example of something we're um, very actively engaged in in California, in addition to the Older Americans Act. Yeah, so to build upon that, so Susan and I are required to submit a plan to the feds. Uh, We do it every four years, ours is due next month. Um, and that is going to show um, how we're going to meet federal priorities, but it's it's only a piece of what we do. We then, you know, um, from our four year plan, we require our counties to also submit a plan on all of the services we provide, how they're going to spend the money, who they're going to serve, how they're going to target resources to those um, hardest uh, to serve, diversity, equity, inclusion, rural areas, things of that nature. We also have a network of 1,200 community-based organizations and partners. So that's just the Older Americans Act part. Um, We're a little bit different. The least amount of money that I get is from the feds. Hmm. Um, The second largest amount is from the state. The counties are the largest payer in New York State for these services. Why? It's because of this job Susan had. Your constituents are the ones you see every day. All politics are local. And they put in, we, in addition to having match requirements for federal and state, uh, they, they put in what we call overmatch, which is an additional. To Susan's point, older people don't live in the offices for the aging. They touch every single system. I have 24,500 veterans on our caseload, 14,000 individuals with diagnosed mental health issue, 8,500 with an alcohol and substance abuse. I won't even get into problem gambling. We have 350,000 grandparents taking care of grandkids. And so whether you're doing master plan on aging or age-friendly communities, if you're not pulling all the pieces of state agencies, local agencies, and the public-private partnerships together, then you're serving people siloed and not holistically. That's when they fall through the cracks, yeah. and that's when they're not able to age successfully in place. So it is an all-hands-on-deck approach. Hmm. And then, Lindsay, how does your role fit into all of this? So uh, Chief Geriatric Officer, what is that? That's a good question. And 
to some extent, the chief geriatric officer role is something that we're still defining and that's evolving. To our knowledge in San Diego, our county is the first county to have a chief geriatric officer. So I think to some extent, um, the, the county doesn't necessarily know what they don't know about geriatrics, just like I don't necessarily know what I don't know about the county and yeah. local government and national government and state government. So bottom line, it's really trying to work across our different departments. So not just with our aging and independent services, but also with our behavioral health services, with our public health services, with our medical care services to really have everyone see older people as part of their work. I think it can be tempting to kind of silo it to, oh, that's just aging and independent services. They deal with that. But it's actually every service we're providing really should be taking into account the unique needs of older people. And so I'm trying to help um, have a more unified effort in that way in our county by interfacing with all the departments and asking questions from a geriatrician perspective. Hmm. Are there other chief geriatric officers in other counties that you know of? She said no for no, California. No, but but elsewhere? Not that we know of. And isn't that crazy that um, Lindsay uh, is the first and we're we're fast approaching in our state well, where we'll have between probably close to 11 million Californians, 60 plus, and that this is the first dedicated uh, chief geriatric officer. Well, let me ask you this, because Alex, how clear are you so far in this structure? I think I'm seeing sort of the, um, I don't know if it's a branching tree or a yeah. sort of org chart in my mind. And it, it seems to be a tremendous amount of variation by state. I imagine there are some states that have poorly funded offices or um, and other states that have uh, more robust offices. Well, I guess the question yeah. then, go ahead, Greg. Oh, uh, very much. So I was talking to one of my colleagues in a fairly large state who had uh, four four full time staff at the state unit. Wow! Uh, there's one state that doesn't. How have many do you have, life. Greg? Just for comparison, um, we have a uh, hundred and thirty eight, which is wow. you know, mm -hmm. it's fairly good size. But the like I yeah. said, the the game, the beauty of the way we're structured, it's top down, bottom up at the same time, grassroots oriented. So we're all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. We can't succeed without our local partners. And vice versa. There's states, um, you know, where, like I said, the state unit is the AAA. So I got, I got another question then. So how important, if at all, is it that providers know about these structures? Like I go to the gas station, I just get my gas and I leave. I don't really care what their organizational structure looks like. I just want my gas. If you're a provider in the community, how important is it to know all of these, like the state, the the triple A's, and where, and how should they it's interact not, with this system? It's not. Um, there's too many things that folks have to offer uh, for people to remember. So, you know, when I public speak and talk about the 25 core services you'll find everywhere in the state, yeah. that's really not important. What's important is that you have a, uh, a place to go, a trusted resource to start. Uh, one of the beauties of Susan's and our network, uh, and I think I can speak for her, is we're not selling a product and we're not selling a service. We're selling objectivity, information, independence, and choice. And that's critical. So, for example, I'm coming out of the hospital. Um, you know, the hospital discharge planner may not know all the services available. So they're going to say meals on wheels or you might need home care. Right. Yeah. And if you call up one of those entities, good chance are you're going to walk away with one of those services. And that's not necessarily bad. But if we're able to look at somebody holistically and I've got a, a veteran um, that uh, has never connected with the Department of Veteran Services in New York State and is eligible for maybe 115 federal, state and local veterans benefits, uh, and services, that's the interconnectedness. So I see somebody like Lindsay being extraordinarily important because I think what we both said is this is about connecting the dots. Yeah. Um, the, the growing older isn't the problem. It's the way we've organized our caring economy. And that's what needs to change is um, how you start first at the front end in the community, how you leverage the assets and resources that are across various systems um, so that you can solve the problem or address the issues then before they get to a point 
where they're, you're at a point of no return. Uh, because I think the general public has no idea what all the state and local agencies do to support older adults and their families in general. So it's that first place that you start where it may not be the AAA's job, but we've, we're organized where they have to have the partnerships and they know who the players are and they know who to, who to make a referral to. And that referral can be done in real time, a soft handoff. Hmm. And you know, so I, I, I couldn't agree more with Greg that we uh, all of that should be invisible to a consumer. And that's something we're putting a lot of resources towards is to really, you know, flatten things so that navigation, um, so brand name and awareness and navigation are easy and people mm-hmm. just know where to get started. And then the system responds yeah. in turn. Which is, which is, so let's say I, I am a provider, a healthcare provider taking, let's say a nurse practitioner working in a clinic that's mainly caring for older adults. I have a 76 year old who's not doing well at home, not getting a lot of services. And like, we want to try to like, they're not getting the an, enough nutrition. You're worried about weight loss. Like you're worried about how things are going at home. What should that person do with the structures that are available right now? So you came from New York. Uh, let's say you're in Westchester County. I would yeah. hope a referral would go to what's called an ADRC, and it's called an Aging and Disability Resource Center. I think most states have them. Ours is, you know, a, a thirty-five million dollar systems change that includes a variety of organizations. But that's kind of the front door, right? Because again, you know, we're a crisis-driven network. Um, I like what Lindsay said earlier. I say this all the time. You don't know what you don't know until you need to know it. You don't need to know about uh, property tax relief until you buy a house. You don't need to know about tap and Pell until your kid goes to college. Most people don't know about these services until they need them. And that's just kind of the way uh, that it is. But I would hope, and this is a lot what we're working with, with um, really the embracing of this new term, social determinants of health, which we've all been doing for decades, Mm -hmm. um, to to really integrate um, models and systems that bring social services and clinical services together together. So that referral can be made. We can do a comprehensive assessment and then let the individual, and if they're lucky enough to have a family member or a caregiver, know what's out there and what choices they have. And then they ultimately have the responsibility because they live their own lives to, to accept or decline or to take the risk in terms of um, their, their own care. But these things need to be coordinated. Then you yeah. add a layer of technology over it, which is a, a huge bonus there's so many great tech tools out there now that older adults are using and can use mm-hmm. um, to really wrap around the social services and the clinical services. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate what Greg is saying. And just going back to that patient, I'll tell you, before I started this role, I would have probably looked at the handout box in our clinic and been like, oh, okay, here's a Meals on Wheels handout and here's a like fall prevention yeah. handout and we don't have a social worker. So I'm, yeah. we just kind of start to amass these handouts and I would give them to the patient. And now I realize, and I'm kind of embarrassed that um, really what I should have been doing was calling our county 911 or referring the patient to call our aging and independent services. Wait, county 911? Our county 211. Oh, <laughs> Oops. Well, that got people's attention. Okay. 211 is actually for our oh, county. It's an urgent issue. Not everyone necessarily has that central yeah. number for their whole county. But the point is, is that I am now learning that there were so many resources and services that I did not know about that my patients did not ultimately know about because I, I only yeah. was aware of a spattering. Yeah. yeah, I know Alex wants to ask a question, but we, we mentioned another thing, ADRC. Susan, what the heck is that? <laughs> That's another acronym we haven't talked about yet. Yes. So th- this is sort of the glue, uh, the Aging and Disability Resource Connection. So working with AAAs, independent living centers, really helping in four core areas to really help people with options counseling and navigation in in the network. So really to be a bridge between whether it's a health plan on the healthcare side, Greg mentioned a hospital discharge, which is so common. That's when a lot of people first discover our network, unfortunately, at that late stage. Um, so trained, trained staff that can really help provide 
options and alternatives, mm-hmm. again, at, as Greg said, where the individual chooses what works best for them. But working, you know, California is a big managed care state. And so there's a lot of, you know, one thing that's exciting is closed loop referrals where we can work with the physician's office or the health plan. And we can do follow up and say, here's what was provided. And then the health plan can say, can you follow up on this? Um, And we can offer things, um, you know, someone presents with a nutritional need, but we can say, you know, ask about, do you need grab bars in your shower? Mm. Would you be a candidate for adult daycare? Uh, Do you have a caregiver in the house who might need? Um, So people aren't always um, seeking the services because they don't know that they're available. And to get into, yeah, uh, I, to, to get that evaluation, what needs to be done to to get that evaluation for the? Is it the provider that calls? Is it the patient either? Or? Either. No, so, yeah. yeah. So for us, and again, I started my career doing this, and the beauty, again, and I can only speak for New York, um, we're in the home. This is not stuff that's being done over the phone. I would go into somebody's home where I could do a visual check. Uh, are there fall um, and injury risks? Is there food in the refrigerator? Uh, I can spend some time. You know, my caseload was 90 people. It, they, I knew them. I developed a relationship with them. Take some time to get trust, to get real information. Um, and you assess in a whole variety of different ways. Like we assess for social isolation, anxiety, depression, alcohol abuse. We do a tech check. I became the first state in the country to... Um, Uh, offer free for our case managers, the National Association of Home Builders Certified Aging in Place um, certification, which provides enhanced skills that you can provide to the individual and family on modifications within the built environment. um, So they don't fall and break your hip and wind up uh, having to to leave. So having that visual is really important. As a managed care state also, our care uh, managers in managed care for Medicaid could be 300 miles away. Uh, They're never in the home. It's somebody different every month. And you never develop that relationship. It's people don't want to talk about um, their needs um, or the things they can't do. They're afraid of losing their independence. And our network helps to maintain that independence. 60% of all medical costs have nothing to do with your health diagnosis. It has to do with genetics, 30%, 10% your diagnosis. The other 60% is your built environment educational status, income, and your personal choices. Do I have access to good food? Do I exercise? Do I smoke? Things like that. The name of the game for this country in terms of saving money and improving health outcomes and actually talking about quality of life, not quantity of life, is to beef up uh, what Susan, Lindsay, and I do across the country. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'd love to pick up in this thread and sort of segue into talking about social determinants of health and hear from all three of you, maybe maybe starting at the local level with Lindsay and then Susan and Greg. I'm going to quote, um, so there was an article in JAMA Internal Medicine recently by um, Madeline Sterling, who's in New York at, uh, well, Cornell, um, obtaining and paying for home care, navigating patients through the complex terrain of home care in the U.S., and it starts with this quote from a caregiver, I don't think I can manage all of this care anymore. And this is so common. And uh, Ken Kavinsky writes, who's a frequent um, guest and host on this podcast, great perspective. U.S. medicine does an awful job of helping older persons with disability obtain the assistance they need to maintain independence. We can pay for high f- high-tech ineffective procedures, but not help with basic needs. It's a disgrace. And then he has a, like a follow-up tweet. Um, in this thread, hypothesis, social security has done more to improve the health of U.S. older persons since its implementation in 1935 than all of the technological advancements in healthcare. Um, and I want to just, you know, sort of push, you know, segue into this social determinants of health aspect. And we had a podcast recently with uh, Margot Cushell, who is studies homelessness, is at San Francisco General. I see Susan nodding her head. You must know her well. Homeless is a huge issue in California. I'm sure it is in New York as well. Aging, homelessness, just a profound issue. So many newly homeless. Um, to what extent, uh, and I heard you mention, Susan, when the California Master Plan on Aging, housing as being one of the key elements. And I just, I wonder what each of you are doing in your own areas. I'm sure this is an issue in San Diego as well. To address social determinants of health, 
Um, and maybe starting with you, Lindsay, um, at the county level. Yeah, so I feel like working in the county has taught me that even more, just the importance of social determinants of health. And um, just to speak briefly of um, the experience of a clinician is oftentimes I think I felt in our my clinic or in other settings that I could I didn't really have the tools to really help the patient what I, with what I thought they really needed the most. So I might feel like loneliness was really the big thing that was impacting their health or um, uh, food insecurity or or whatnot. And, um, you know, I would go to my geriatrician toolbox or just medical toolbox and be like, oh, wow, that's not um, that's not going to really, you know, this pill is not really going to help with what is you know, really uh, impacting this person's health. So when I got to the county, I, I did a, a listening tour and I've, I've been on it for the last six months, just asking every person that I meet what do you feel are the most pressing needs of older people? And I was really ready to just jump into age-friendly clinical health systems uh, as, as my like, top initiative. And um, the response I got was um, about 75% of people that I interviewed asking that question said um, affordable housing mm. and, um, you know, uh, and, and shelter. Um, so I, I was floored by that. And I um, have kind of broadened my scope from um, age-friendly clinical health systems to thinking about age-friendly public health systems. And one thing that would be great to hear, um, Susan is much more expert in this than I am, but um, I have become really excited about this new program in California called CalAIM. Um, I'm sure there are similar ones in New York or similar initiatives, but it's really this major push for the way that we pay for health. So to have a program like Medicaid actually put money into social determinants of health. And I, I think that's a great idea. It makes so much sense to me because it's really all about what helps someone in the in the end. And if if the, the pills and interventions and things aren't really getting people what they want, then let's let's like recalibrate a little bit. Um, but uh, Susan, I'd love to hear your thoughts and responses to that. Sure. So housing is health. That that much we know. And um, thanks for bringing up Dr. Margot Cashel. She's doing phenomenal work, not just in California, but nationally to raise, you know, this this serious, the crisis of older adult homelessness. And we're really proud in our state that the number one goal in our master plan for aging is housing for all stages and ages. And that's, hmm. I mean, when we put that out, that, you know, people are like, housing, you know, isn't, isn't, isn't Medicare, you know, people think of Medicare as the uh, flagship program for older adults. Um, so really putting a lot of focus and, you know, our stakeholders in our state are calling for an end to older adult homelessness. And, you know, the, the profile is slightly different. There are traditional reasons why older adults are homeless. And many of them, it you know, they've been longstanding. They've been unhoused. But for a majority it's a first time event. It's a healthcare crisis. It's, you know, lack of tenant protections, um, death of a spouse. Um, we've also talked to a lot of um, older adults who have been living with a parent. So the caregiver, the, the caregiving parent who is 80 or 90 um, passes away. And then the, the 50 or 60 year old adult child um, loses their housing. So yeah. a whole, uh, you know, confluence of factors that were looking to address. Um, in our state, we have an interagency council on homelessness that's co-chaired by our Secretary of Housing and our Secretary of Health and Human Services. And I'm proud to sit on that uh, council representing older adults um, and was added to that to that um, group. So in terms of the, the area agencies on aging, um, we are partnering with our Transforming Medi-Cal, our Medicaid agency, where we do have um, CMS has been a fantastic partner in, you know, the maximum allowable opportunities for housing assistance, rental assistance, um, temporary payments to keep people housed, and to help place people after a hospitalization into housing. Well, it's interesting that our, our healthcare system, traditionally Medicare too, is willing to pay tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars on a drug 
thousands of dollars on MRIs. I mean, we've had multiple talks about the new amyloid antibody drugs, 25 to 50,000. Never misses a chance to talk about them. But, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't have a house to live in or a place to live, probably has a much bigger impact on uh, their health than... uh, Oh, yeah. you know, some of these medications. Like the number needed to treat with these social determinants of health interventions, I feel so much lower and the lag time to benefit so much shorter than a lot of the medications and interventions yeah. we do. And, Sorry. and Susan, uh, Lindsay also mentioned CalAIM. Can you just briefly, what is that? Sure. So that's our statewide um, Medicaid waiver that is transforming um, our Medi-Cal program over a 10-year Horizon. Uh, we're in about year two right now. Uh, it was approved by CMS last year, but key to this is enhanced care management. So this is, you know, reaching the the highest utilizers with a wraparound suite of services. Mm. Also funding 14 community supports also in lieu of services. So this would be like home modifications, medically tailored meals, caregiver mm. respite, um, you know, 14 services and supports that community-based organizations around the state are offering up um, and they're building capacity, investing in community-based organizations. Um, and then related to that is a whole behavioral health continuum when that's you know a key to housing also um, would be behavioral health and substance use disorder. Mm. Um, so they're working in tandem. Um, so that's something we're really encouraging our community-based providers and you know AAAs to really align with CalAIM and bridge that divide between the physician's office, hospitals, um, and yeah. you know to make themselves available as a as a local resource. Yeah, I feel like so there's a I, groundswell support to- for this in California. Social determinants of health at the grassroots level. And Greg, you, you know, you said you're you're all top down and bottom up, and you're hearing. What are you hearing from at the grassroots level of focus on social determinants of health? Well, you know, this isn't it's great that uh, state Medicaid programs are starting to look at this It's something that Medicare Advantage plans have been able to do for a number of years, but it's their choice to do so. Um, I understand from states, our state, California, why we're focused so much in on Medicaid and uh, high utilization and, and cost and the way to try to influence that away. The, these services um, that everybody is embracing called social determinants of health, again, are, are not new. Um, mm-hmm. These are things that have been we've been providing forever. And mm-hmm. I just want to put a caution out there that you can walk and chew gum at the same time. When we focus on Medicaid, um, and and we should, I think you can improve care, uh, improve quality, and lower cost when you do things right. But the goal is to prevent people from spending down to Medicaid from the be- to begin with. Yeah. Um, and and that's what I'm talking about. Is you could still provide the same SDOH services in a non Medicaid framework. Um, than Medicaid. Most of the people in New York are not on Medicaid and they don't need to be on Medicaid and they can live for years in their homes and communities with a comprehensive array of services. I'll give you a quick example and I'm talking fast because I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, What CMS says and CMS oversees Medicare and Medicaid at the national level is the most expensive utilizers uh, cost about $400 billion a year to serve have two chronic conditions and two limitations in some functional capacity, need help bathing, dressing, personal care, um, going to the bathroom, uh, that type of thing. My average client is an 83-year-old low-income female that has four to 10 chronic conditions and about seven limitations in their daily activities. And Mm -hmm. I can keep them in their homes for five to seven years for $7,000 a year. They're older and frailer, uh, than a nursing home client is. And then all the other things that Susan and Lindsay were talking about, support for a caregiver. We have 4 million caregivers that you pull them out of the mix. Uh, you pay an, another $39 billion. We used to think that what family, friends, and neighbors do in providing uncompensated care to somebody um, was a wraparound around the formal system. It's the opposite. The formal system is a wraparound on what families, friends, and neighbors are have been doing for generations and are doing now. That, that's that's brilliant, Greg. I can also sense from all of you the the passion that you have for this, 
And just, I can imagine the frustration that you see with some of the priorities potentially that our system has, especially the formal system around keeping people in their homes. I think when you think about kind of where we are in the near future, what are you most worried about right now around the care of older adults in the community? Greg, I'm going to turn to you first. I'm actually quite optimistic because what these conversations allow you to do, um, you were talking about, you know, being a geriatrician and doing your rounds. Uh, you're talking about physicians' offices. The reason they don't know what we and other community-based organizations, town and municipalities, faith-based or they don't know what they uh, what they don't know. The opportunities, whether it be through Medicaid, through waivers, through Medicare Advantage, through other yeah. payers, um, is the opportunity to provide and test integrated care models so that when somebody comes through the system and a physician or a nurse practitioner in a, in a community practice or somebody uh, discharge planner in a hospital, yeah. that you have that knowledge base where you can do those cross referrals and do them in an electronic way that are HIPAA compliant. Like how amazing would it be for um, an emergency room physician to get an electronic transfer of, of the data that we have on the client, who they are, who's at home, yeah. what medications they're yeah. taking, what services are being provided, or uh, when that person's being discharged, they have that discharge plan come to one of our case managers um, mm -hmm. so that we actually, we can connect the dots. That's how people don't fall through the cracks. That's how you provide quality care. That's how the plans heat us scores. These are these scores that, you know, show their quality. They're looking for partnerships like this. And what I hear all the time is we didn't know you existed. Yeah. And so my job is our county offices are not good at making the case, doing the elevator speech, walking into a CEO's uh, office yeah. and saying what it is they do. What they're really good at is providing the service. It's yeah. my job to make that connection, sell what we do, and then contract together so we can expand. So let me ask you this, Greg, before I move on. I am uh, a healthcare provider in New York. Um, I'm listening to this podcast. I'm interested... I want to learn more about resources that I can refer people to. What's the one place I should go to? Give me a call. <laughs> New York State Office for Aging. We have a fantastic association partner, um, and her and I are really, you know, we're talking. You know, um, so you know, seriously, to a lot I am. I am a let's say nurse practitioner, a community clinic. I call Greg. Yep. Okay. And we'll connect you with our local resources. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, it's, a, it's, it's really about connecting dots. I don't think that I, people are in this caring economy because they do care, but yeah. you don't know what you don't know. Um, yeah. and, and, and if you're open to, uh, again, Susan and I have to leverage other resources because we're not resourced at yeah. the federal level enough to do our job. So we have to have uh, be open and partner with everybody because we're not experts in everything. We're experts in what we do, but then yeah. you tap the experts that are experts in other things. And you, when you bring those things together, good things can happen. Susan, I'm a nurse practitioner now in uh, um, rural California, and I'm looking. I'm listening to the podcast. I want to know kind of where should I find out about the resources that I have available to my older adults. Thank you for working in rural Northern California, nurse <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> um, you will call 1-800-510-2020, and that's where you'll get started, and we'll patch you through to, to your local area agency on aging. That's where you'll get started. Okay. Um, so I want to go to your other question, you know, being um, asset base, but I think, you know, there's a lot of attention on the care economy right now. There've been some fabulous national articles. Um, I think there's broad agreement about people being able to live independently at home for as long as possible and to move away from a more institutional bias, but there is a workforce crisis happening in every rung of the career ladder right now. And that is in part influenced by the changing demographics in our nation as people are leaving the workforce and not being replenished um, as birth rates decline. Um, so, you know, one thing that um, I think is really important is raising awareness about what people, how people should plan in their individual lives, how 
communities should be planning, how states should be planning, and how our nation should be planning. And, you know, something that breaks my heart over and over and over again is when somebody believes that Medicare will take care of, you know, they they say, well, I want to live independently. I want to stay in my home as long as possible. And they have um, the false belief that Medicare will pay for home care, will pay for assisted living. And they discover uh, very late in life that that is not not the case. And so, you know, Greg alluded to it, this sort of missing middle or forgotten middle, a a portion, a large portion of our population um, that is not eligible for Medicaid Mm -hmm. and cannot pay privately Mm -hmm. for for long or much, um, you know, to remain at home. Well, um yeah, I'm going to leave the parting thought to Lindsay. Lindsay, what are you most worried about or eager to see? Thank you for that. Um, thank you for putting I you on the hot seat. You am, mean. <laughs> yeah, thank you for putting me on the hot seat. I feel like I know locally, at least at our county level, and I believe at the state level, and, and hopefully likely national level as well, there's a lot of energy around equity right now and, you know, diversity, belonging, inclusion. Yeah. And I really want people to start seeing ageism as, as a fundamental part of that. So not just us that are involved in the aging space, but everyone, yeah. I, I don't hear that mentioned a lot. And I think a lot of the reason that we have some of the challenges we have in building capacity for to leverage the strengths and to support our aging population is because of decades of ageism that led to inattention to unique needs and values of older people. So I'm hoping too that our geriatrician and palliative care community, so we're just gonna lean into this Mm -hmm. because really we, over the last couple of decades, just like Greg and Susan and our community-based partners, we really have as a specialty recognized the importance of social determinants and environment. And we've always had that holistic approach. And so good for us. I'm going to give us a pat on the back. We haven't necessarily uh, become the most lucrative specialties yeah. in the field, but but if we can all lean into this, like this is what we're good at and contact your local area on agents. It is area agency on aging and start making those connections and be the leaders in this space. I think that there's a lot of opportunity there for a beautiful new day. Yes, <laughs> I got to transition to Alex now. <laughs> You're on the road, but you've got no destination. You're in the mud. In the maze of her imagination, you love this town. Even if that doesn't ring true, you've been all over. And it's been all over you. It's a beautiful day. The sky falls, you feel like a beautiful day. Don't let Greg, Susan, Lindsay, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Great job, Alex. (laughs) Thanks. All of our listeners, thank you for your continued support. And we'd like to thank everybody who's donated more than $250 over the last year, including Matthew Schuster, Daryl Owens, Susan Nelson, Christopher Heck, Lindsay Yorman, Mo Rizawi, Sue Borson, Carrie Rubenstein, Marissa Galicia Castillo, Kara Bischoff, Kate Mesrich, James Tulski, Louise Aronson, Asher Edwards, Mark Apfel, Michael Bordowski, Dwayne Dobschutz, Fish Brandt, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Times Two, Roseanne Leipzig, <laughs> Elizabeth Chung, Amis Samoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Mateen, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, and Himanshu Mahotra. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Thank you.